So with all the equipment that we've talked about over the past few months, uh, we are now finally starting to get into the realm of what actually makes you function uh, in combat as a trooper. Uh, so what exactly makes a good saber belt? What's authentic? What's not authentic? What's the difference between uh, the, the authentic saber belts uh, that the guys originally used versus the far be reproductions or the, even the mainstream reproductions that are out there. Uh, so welcome to another edition of the 11th OVC and let's talk about the platform that makes you actually effective in combat, your saber belt. The genesis of this style belt goes back decades, and from 1851 going away from the white leather that the U.S. Army used to use, uh, all the way up to 1855 going away from the black buff leather to the black smooth leather. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, Civil War era leather uh, leather goods uh, has a lot of variation in what true authentic Civil War leather goods uh, feels like feels like, looks like, and so forth. Now, so on this episode, we're going to examine a uh, original Civil War saber belt, uh, which actually is on the buff leather side of things. We are going to examine a, a quote unquote authentic or quality reproduction. And then of course, we're going to examine a mainstream reproduction as well. And throughout all this, we'll be talking about the difference and what the difference between all of them on what, what makes a, a good Civil War belt a good Civil War belt. So the first thing I would like to say about saber belts is the biggest noticeable difference in original saber belts versus the reproductions, and that is the weight of the leather. It is nearly impossible to describe to you over this video uh, the weight of original leather, whether it's the leather on saddles, the leather in our carbine slings, or of course our saber belts. Uh, picking up an original is, is makes you realize that the leather then was significantly different than the leather uh, now. Uh, and then that's kind of a common misconception is that the thicker the leather, the stronger the leather is. That is not necessarily true. And I didn't understand the difference myself until I compared originals and feeling them in my hands compared to the reproductions that we get. Secondly, and more importantly, I must be clear and give justice to all leather products used by the U.S. Army in the 1860s. I would have to dive in-depth into period ways they made leather, the different weights of leather, and their use. I do not have the time, especially for this video, to talk about leather making in general in the 1860s, uh, but that's one thing I want to be clear is that the obvious difference uh, that versus anything else out there versus the sewing, rivets versus non-rivets, is that, that how the leather was prepared uh, today versus back then. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about what an original saber belt is, and then of course we compare that to our reproductions. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through every piece of this leather belt, and this is an original uh, saber belt uh, from, from the Civil War that, uh, that we'll go through, and there's some big noticeable differences. As you'll see through some of these close-up pictures, the first major difference that I'm going to talk about is the fact that this is a buff leather saber belt. Now what that means is that the rough side is on the outside, dyed black versus the other side is on the uh, underneath side, not dyed or undyed. Now, the second uh, difference is that uh, you, like kind of what I just said, is uh, most Civil War belts are undyed on the underneath side. They are only, I guess, painted, if you will, even though that's not actual paint. Uh, they're, they're painted on the outside. The black is only on one side of the leather. Next thing we're going to be talking about is the buckle itself. Uh, as you can see in, the, in these pictures, the buckle is a, the, the silver leaf pattern is actually a three-piece silver leaf. You'll see from the bottom, it goes all the way around to the top, and uh, it goes actually behind the eagle's wings, and you can see them uh, coming in to the top, uh, which they actually, in order to do this, they had to have three pieces of that, of that silver leaf. So the next difference that we're going to be talking about on the saber belt uh, is the actual belt itself uh, and how uh, it hooks and, 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 the, uh, and the sewing. Uh, as you can see on, uh, on this back side here, it's actually sewn. In fact, there are no rivets on the belt itself. Uh, the fact that this is buff leather with no rivets, everything is sewn, indicates definitely that this is an early war saber belt. Another thing to look for uh, on originals, if you're looking at originals, or uh, you know, making sure the fit 
looks original is the distance between the shoulder ring right here and the buckle. On most originals, you will see that, uh, especially the early war pattern ones, that you actually have uh, just, just a few inches between the buckle itself and where the shoulder strap actually hooks up into this ring right here. You'll notice on a lot of reproductions that this gap right here is, is you know, up to, up to about 12 inches, up to about a foot, let alone just a few inches for this example right here. So the next thing we'll be talking about is the tri-fold sewing pattern on that shoulder strap ring and the saber ring down here. You'll see that it's actually tri-folded and then sewn into it versus most reproductions, it's not three layers, but rather two layers on top. So now the next thing we're going to be talking about is the uh, the length of the uh, saber hangers, if you will, the leather the leather uh, straps that hang our saber belt. Uh, this is one of the biggest uh, differences between originals and reproductions, from what I can find. Uh, if, if you guys have ever noticed, when you are uh, doing draw saber, you'll notice that if you do it per the manual to reach over your rein hand and grab the uh, the saber itself, a lot of us are reaching way down, way past what we need to, uh, and some of us get lazy and reach either under our rein hand uh, or drop and re you know, reach way over how it's not designed. And the reason for that is because uh, reproduction saber belts have had the leather straps significantly longer than, than, than they need to be. Uh, the couple of original saber belts that I've been able to measure, uh, the, the one that we have here that we're looking at today, uh, the, the first strap, or what I call the, the short strap, uh, it's right around 8 to 10 inches. 8 to 10 inches is, is all it is. Uh, the uh, quality, the quote, quote, quality of uh, reproduction, authentic uh, reproduction I'm wearing right now, uh, instead of 8 to 10 inches, it's about 11 inches. And the mainstream, uh, the mainstream saber belts, uh, that, that first or that short strap, uh, is anywhere between 13 and 15 inches uh, from what I've measured, and I've measured about 10 or 15 different ones. Uh, and so it ranges between, usually about that 13 to 14 inch mark is what we're looking at. Uh, so you're, you're looking at a, a, a two to three, sometimes a four inch difference on reaching down, and even two inches, one inch makes a big difference when you're reaching above your rein hand. So that's one thing you can do to improve your impression is shorten, excuse me, <clears throat> you, one thing you can do is shorten that first strap, that short strap, to around the 9 or 10 inch mark uh, to make it significantly easier to reach over your rein hand and draw a saber exactly how you're supposed to. So along the same lines, let's talk about the rear strap holding your saber on as well. Uh, uh, from the original that we have and a couple other originals that we've measured, uh, this original saber belt, of course, that you can see in these pictures, is around 24 or so inches. Uh, and they, from what I can tell, they average between 24 and 25 inches, or the one I think was 23, but right around 24 or 25 inches. Uh, the uh, authentic, quote unquote authentic, reproductions out there are right around 27 to 29 inches for their, for that back uh, strap uh, on the bottom strap for the Sabre. And on the uh, mainstream reproductions, they're anywhere from 29 to 32 inches. Uh, so again, if you want to make it easier to draw a Sabre and be more authentic at the same, uh, same time, is to actually shorten the length of these straps, keep those uh, buttons on there, but shorten the length of those straps to, uh, to hike them up a little bit closer to your body while you're riding on your horse. So the next thing we'll be talking about is the accoutrements on your leather belt. First off here is the uh, the pistol cartridge, the pistol box right here. Uh, you'll see that actually the, there's a rivet on the front which indicates uh, later on in the war. Uh, but the most notable difference, and this is the biggest thing that's uh, hard to understand for a lot of reenactors on what they pay for when they get reproduction boxes, is the sewing pattern on these things. As you can see that the sewing around this pistol box is very, very fine and very, very uniform. It's a very good quality sewing job. Also, on the end here, nothing is glued like a lot of reproduction uh, boxes are. Uh, you'll see on the back that there's two, uh, two rivets holding on the belt loops to the back which is uh, normal and indicative of all throughout the war. 
Uh, early war, they would have had uh, a sewn keeper on the front, but rivets on the back from my understanding. Uh, but later on in the war, they, they started putting rivets uh, elsewhere as well. Uh, one of the things that I like to talk about uh, when it comes to good quality accoutrements and, and getting your money's worth is good leather care and good sewing patterns. Like I said before, I've had uh, you know leather literally or like accoutrements, whether my pistol or other accoutrements, rip off of my belt uh, through through a lot of hard riding and campaigning, and I have have yet to have any good quality reproduction or authentic production uh, fall off my sail belt. Uh, of course, that was with a lot of uh, a lot of hard. Uh, campaigning. Uh, but again, uh, notice the stitching around here. Notice the uh, the folding pattern and on the inside, notice the uh, the, the keeper on the, the pin itself here. Um, on the back, like I said, you have sewing on the, the back end of it, uh, on the bottom and all throughout, and all the sewing is good, high quality stitching. One of the uh, other thing that's kind of good uh, and kind of fun too is the inspector marks. Uh, as you'll see here on the very front, uh, they have the manufacturer and the quartermaster's inspector marks uh, coming from, uh, from the arsenal there where they inspected it. Uh, also, something interesting is on the back uh, cover here, there's no inspector marks. Now keep in mind, this is just one box from one manufacturer from one arsenal. Uh, this by no means is representative of all pistol boxes. But what the, the biggest thing to take away from this is the sewing pattern, the quality of the leather, uh, and the marks on the side of them. Now let's talk about the pistol holster uh, as well. Obviously we're talking right hand side, butt forward, uh, but one of the things to note between good quality reproductions, uh, originals, uh, and of course in the Farby mainstream ones, is how your, your pistol box or how your pistol holster is uh, sewn. As you'll see, one of the first indications is to look on how the bottom plug is sewn. Uh, again, you can tell good quality stitching from non-good quality stitching. Uh, also, I would say one of the biggest differences between good quality reproductions, originals, and then of course the mainstream reproductions is how they sew this mainstream up the entire, whether you call it the belly or the spine, of that holster. As you can see in this original, uh, you have really good, uh, you know, really good mending, really good seam, uh, and stitched very finely and very intricately all the way from the bottom plug all the way up to the top of the holster uh, as well. Uh, as you can see in these pictures, on the uh, on the good quality reproduction, it looks very similar to that uh, of the original. However, when you look at these pictures from the, uh, you know, the mainstream uh, non-authentic uh, reproduction, you can see that the, the seam going up the side, it hasn't been pinched, it hasn't been seamed really well, and so basically what they did is they just folded it over and sewed it uh, horizontally along, along the edge, uh, which allows it to rip apart significantly sooner and easier than the good quality reproductions. A lot of people ask, Steve, is this, you know, is, is this holster worth what I'm paying for it because I can get one for half the cost uh, from this mainstream uh, vendor and the answer is yes it is because it's fine uh, seams these fine seams right here allow it not to rip apart as easy as the mainstream reproductions so when it comes to you know spending a lot of money for not a lot of look well, you may not be able to tell, you know, to the untrained eye, but from a functionality standpoint, I've had multiple uh, pistol boxes, or uh, pistol holsters, sorry, rip off my belt versus I have yet to have a single good quality reproduction pistol holster uh, rip off my belt. Uh, so a lot of that is my own fault because uh, I can tell, I can see it fraying when I'm riding. I've had, you know, on, on campaign, I've had a couple days to fix it with my all if I wanted to, but I'm too lazy. And, and, and of course, a couple days later, it fell off my belt. And that was always been the, the cheap reproduction or the cheap um, main steam re reproductions. Uh, so getting good quality pistol uh, holsters is one of, probably for me, the biggest investments that you can make in your Sabre belt. 
So on the inside of the pistol uh, holster, you will see that there's uh, basically three major rivets holding the belt flap on. That is indicative of, of actually throughout the war, to my understanding, is the rivets on the inside. Now, however, rivets on the outside uh, are indicative of later patterns later on in the war. Uh, early patterns would have been completely sewn. Uh, in this original, you have uh, a sewn and a rivet onto the, the keeper right here. Uh, so again, this would be a considered a late war um, addition to this saber belt. Now let's take a look at the, the cap box right here. Uh, you know, same thing with, with everything we've been talking about. If you take a look at originals versus uh, quality reproductions versus mainstream reproductions, you'll get an idea of number one, why they're expensive, and number two, why it really matters. With this cap pouch right here, uh, the keeper is uh, all one piece to the, to, with the, the front shield there. Uh, the stitching is very fine on both layers. You have on the second layer here, you have the inspector and manufacturer's marks on the front and you lift that up and of course you have the the uh, the felt or the wool on the inside uh, with where your caps would be all around the edge you have good quality fine sewing uh, along the both the front and the back side also on this back side you have two rivets on the belt loop again to my understanding uh, those rivets on the belts were normal uh, throughout the war uh, however the rivets on the keepers both on the pistol cap or the pistol box the pistol holster and other accoutrements uh, uh, rivets on the on the keepers would actually indicate later on in the war so if you're like me, all these details may be nice, uh, but they might be a little too anal, if you will, uh, when it just comes to reenacting. I mean, after all, this is a hobby, uh, and I mean, why spend $100 on a pistol box when you can spend $30 instead? In short, while you may not care about exactly how the stitching on the boxes are, you may be thinking it's the weight of the leather doesn't really matter that much, uh, from the 20 foot rule, you may not be able to tell the difference. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience, however, uh, like I've said before, I've had multiple cheap uh, reproduction leather goods break, snap, tear, rip off my belt, and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, and, you know, make your choice. Me personally, if I can't afford it, uh, the, the cat pouch, I may skimp on, but the pistol holster itself, I definitely get a good quality one because with those, with that good quality sewing, with the good quality seams, uh, it won't rip off because obviously your pistol is enough weight in there that if you ride hard and you get a lot of, a lot of abrasive work on that uh, pistol holster, it may rip off, which I've had done a couple times to me uh, with the mainstream reproductions. So, you know, pick and choose. If you can't afford a, a authentic everything, uh, pick and choose what's best for me. Uh, like I said, I, I may skimp on the cat pouch and go, uh, go with the good quality reproduction pistol holster. And through this entire discussion, one thing to keep in mind is that the original guys use this equipment longer and harder in the field than we do. What worked for them was an accumulation of decades of trial and error. Additionally, having quality items for your impression helps with your overall impression uh, versus the, what we've talked about in other episodes, the three strike rule. You may be wondering, does it really matter, you know, what stitch, what weight of leather, all this kind of stuff that we've been talking about in this episode, but with it, when it comes to the three strike rule, looking authentic versus looking very inauthentic is a progression of strikes against you. Uh, whether you choose the wrong uh, wool for uniform, the wrong type of hat, if you choose the wrong uh, saber belt, the wrong saber, the wrong pistol, the wrong pistol holster, uh, the wrong boots, uh, every strike you have against you goes back to looking extremely farby. I mean, seriously, we don't want, I mean, our hobby doesn't want to get to the point to where we're buying uh, Halloween costumes for Civil War reenacting. Obviously, that would be considered extremely farby. So the question is, where do we draw the line? And of course, this being a hobby, everyone draws their line differently, but I'm telling you in these episodes, so do what you know what should be. That way you can choose where you want your strikes and where you may not want your strikes to make sure you keep the minimum level of strikes against you uh, to look as authentic as possible while still not, we'll still, uh, not spending as much as, uh, as others may. 
So that's it for this episode talking about your saber belt as a Civil War reenactor and trooper. Uh, the biggest thing to keep in mind, like we talked about in the short video, was the idea of keeping you know, good sewing patterns, making sure uh, the good quality leather, uh, the good stitching, and rivets in the certain places that you need to. Uh, that, all of that combined makes a good quality saber belt. Uh, again, look, take a look at the uh, length. Uh, of your uh, saber straps, make sure they're not too long as most reproductions are. Uh, and you take all that in consideration, uh, you can hopefully improve your impression by adjusting your saber belt as much as you can. Now one of the questions that uh, inevitably will be asked uh, after this episode is the idea of why didn't you talk about all the different types of leathers and the dyeing methods and the treating methods and how you make leather, period, correct why? Uh, you got, like I said at the beginning of this video, we don't have the time right now to cover that. Uh, I strongly recommend studying that on your own. Uh, another thing that comes out is where do you put everything? Where do you put your, your holster and your cap pouch and all, all the things on our saber belts? Because if, if you are skinny, that actually might be a problem because you can't pack everything. Well, you can. You're packing everything into a small saber belt, including your carbine cartridge box, becomes fairly difficult. Uh, other, uh, the only thing I can say about that is make it whatever you want. As long as the pistol is butt forward on your right hand side and your cap pouch is somewhere on the front side of you, everything else is what is best and most capable for you as the trooper. So thank you uh, so much for watching the 11th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry. I uh, hope this episode was useful to you. Uh, hopefully a little shorter episode than the, uh, the extremely long canteen episode that we just did. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you, ask any questions you may have. Uh, we're gonna be, we're working on a, uh, a skirmish episode uh, as, far, as far as mounted and dismounted skirmishing, so look forward to that. Uh, thank you again for watching the 11th OVC and have a great day.